All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the second Physics 216 video. Um, if you can believe it, I recorded this video already, had the whole thing uploaded to YouTube, and there was no audio. The microphone was turned off of the recording app. So that was fun. So here we are. I'm going to make a second attempt at this. Um, the purpose of this second video is to hopefully derive Kepler's first law, which was the law of ellipses, planets orbit the sun in an ellipse with the sun at a focus. And, and then if we have time, hopefully we'll also do the third law, which is the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. Um, before we begin, let's just review some of the things that we did last time that will be important for us. Um, one of the things that we did is we said, well, let's suppose we have some planet moving along some path and we're going to measure, maybe this is the sun, and we're going to measure the position of the planet with some position vector r and r hat is a unit vector that's in the direction of r. So then at some time later, we have a different position, say r prime, and we're going to have a unit vector whose length is still 1, but its direction has changed. And what we did is we worked out a way of calculating the time derivative of this unit vector. And so last time what we have found is that r hat dot was equal to theta dot theta hat. If we were measuring some angle theta, say with respect to horizontal, then we, let's suppose that we're going to measure angles in the counterclockwise sense, then we also defined a theta hat vector. And so over here we're going to have a theta hat prime. And so we worked out also the derivative of the theta hat, the time derivative of theta hat, and that was minus theta dot r hat. So those will be some important results to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that I'll remind you of is that we had worked out an equation for how the radius of an ellipse changes, uh, depends on angle theta. So the equation for radius of the ellipse as a function of theta. And that looked like r was equal to alpha, this lattice rectum, plus uh, divided by 1 plus the eccentricity times cosine of theta. Okay, so what we will try to do is we will try to show using an analysis of Newton's uh, second law, f equals ma, that our planet, subject to the gravitational force of the sun, follows an elliptical path. Okay, so let's draw an elliptical type path and we'll place the sun over here at one of the focuses and then our planet maybe is sitting over here and it's a little mass, it's uh, mass is little m. And so r hat is going to be this unit vector and the distance between the sun and the planet is r and the force on the planet is fg. It's the gravitational force due to the sun and it's an attractive force so this force is along the minus r hat direction. So the equation of motion, or equivalently Newton's second law, is that the mass times acceleration of the planet 
which is two derivatives of the position vector, must be equal to the force. And the only force acting on our planet is the gravitational force. It's in the minus r hat direction, as I said. And it's proportional to 1 over r squared, where k is a constant and that's equal to the gravitational constant times the product of the sun's mass and the planet's mass. So what we need to do is we need to evaluate time derivatives of the position vector r in order to construct our equation of motion. So let's write r is equal to some magnitude and then it's in the r hat direction. So our dot by product rule is our magnitude dot r hat plus r r hat dot, but we know that r hat dot is theta dot in the theta hat direction. Okay, um, we need two derivatives, so we're going to do our double dot is equal to d by dt of r dot r hat plus r theta dot theta hat. And so we have to do product rule again on both these terms. So the first term, what we're going to get is r double dot r hat, and then by product rule, that's going to be r dot r hat dot. And then we have the second term, and we have the product of three things that all depend on time, the radius, theta dot, and theta hat. So we have to do product rule twice. First, we have the r derivative, r dot, and we get theta dot, theta hat. Then we have, let's do the derivative of theta dot, so that's theta double dot, and we have theta hat. And then we have to do theta hat dot. Okay, so this is going to be r theta dot theta hat dot. Okay, we've already used this once. Uh, r hat dot is theta dot theta hat, and theta hat dot is minus theta dot r hat. So when we rewrite this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect terms that have r hats in them. So we'll have an r hat here, um, and we'll have an r hat here. We have two of them. Okay, so we get a r double dot minus, it looks like r, and then two factors of theta dot. Okay. And then we'll collect terms that have theta hats in them. There's one, two, three of them. Okay, so we get a plus. Uh, so this first one is r dot theta dot, and the second one is also r dot theta dot. So the first two theta hat terms are identical, and we get two of r dot theta dot. And then the other one is an r theta double dot. So that's two derivatives of the position vector, or that's the acceleration of our planet. So inserting that into the equation of motion, m r double dot is equal to minus k over r squared r hat, what we end up with is m r double dot minus r theta dot squared r hat plus 2 r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot theta hat is equal to minus k 
over r squared r hat. And I'm going to do something silly here. I'm going to do plus 0 times theta hat. OK. Um, now, what must be the case is that the factors multiplying r hat must be the same on both sides of the equation. So we have the r hat's terms on the left and right hand side must be equal. And it must also be that the theta hat terms on the left and right hand sides must be equal. So therefore, we require the following. 1 is going to be that um, m r double dot minus r theta dot squared must be equal to minus k over r squared. And 2 is that um, in this case, I don't really care about the m. So we could take the theta hat terms set them equal to each other, we'd get m times 2 r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot equals 0. But then we could just divide by the m if we wanted to. And we would be left with uh, 2 r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot is equal to 0. Okay, what we're going to do first is we're going to work on equation 2 and we're going to show that this is equivalent to conservation of angular momentum. We used the conservation of angular momentum when we derived Kepler's second law of equal areas in equal time. Let's just verify that we can get the same results. So to do this, we consider first the time derivative of r squared theta dot. And so what is that equal to? Uh, again, this is another product rule and chain rule, in fact. So we would get first the derivative of r squared, which would be 2r r dot. And then we multiply by theta dot. And then we would have r squared times the derivative of theta dot, which is theta double dot. There's a common factor of r that we could take out. So we factor out the r. And we're left with 2 r dot theta dot plus r theta double dot. But by equation 2, this is equal to 0 by equation 2. And that means that d by dt r squared theta dot is equal to 0, or r squared theta dot is equal to a constant. So that's interesting because we know, of course, that r, the distance between the planet and the sun, changes with time if it's an elliptical orbit. So r is always changing. Um, so it must be that theta dot changes in exactly the right way so that r squared times theta dot remains constant everywhere in the orbit. So we we already saw that angular momentum, which is m r squared theta dot, was equal to a constant. Therefore, this r squared theta dot which we could write as L divided by M. And I'm going to define L divided by M, the angular momentum divided by mass, 
as script L because it's this is something that will show up quite a bit in today's derivation. Okay, so the conclusion is that equation 2 is just another equivalent statement of conservation of angular momentum. Okay. So next, the goal is to solve equation one to determine how R varies with theta. We want to show that we recover the equation oh sorry this software is beginning to be troublesome so we want to show that we recover the equation of an ellipse Um, and so that was something that r was alpha constant divided by 1 plus the eccentricity times cosine theta. All right. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a long technical derivation, but let's just see what happens. What we're going to do, well, since we're here, equation one has an r double dot in it. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a calculation of r double dot. Um, so to make progress with equation one, we define r as some other variable is just 1 over u. So u is the inverse of r. Okay. Or u is equal to 1 over r. Okay. So equation 1 requires r double dot. So let's start by calculating r dot. So r dot is d by dt of 1 over u. And by chain rule, that is minus 1 over u squared times u dot. OK. Um, so if we think of an ellipse, and here we are, and we're going to measure theta from horizontal. Clearly, as the orbit changes, as we change the value of theta, we're going to also change the length of r. So clearly, R depends on theta. If U is 1 over R, this means that U 
which equals 1 over r is also theta dependent. Okay, so in other words, u is going to be some function of theta. All right, um, so why does that matter? Well, it matters because what we can do is we can write the time derivative of u in another way. So therefore, by chain rule, d by dt of u of theta is equal to du d theta d theta dt, which is just theta dot du d theta. OK, but we already have an expression involving theta dot, but we know that uh, r squared theta dot was equal to a constant, and it was equal to the angular momentum divided by the mass. We called that little l. OK, um, Okay, but r is 1 over u, and so therefore what we've got is 1 over u squared is r squared times theta dot is equal to l. So this is one important expression. Of course, we could also multiply by u squared, and we could get theta dot is u squared times l. So these are two things. We're going to use them both. All right. What we were doing is we were trying to calculate r dot. So r dots up here at the top of the screen was minus 1 over u squared u dot. OK, so we had r dot was equal to minus 1 over u squared u dot. And u dot, we determined, was equal to theta dot du d theta. So we've got minus 1 over u squared theta dot du d theta. u squared over theta dot uh, sorry, theta dot over u squared is just L. And so what we end up with is that r dot is equal to minus L du d theta. OK, good. So that's not so bad. Um, what equation 1 involves, if you remember, is two time derivatives of r. So we need to calculate r double dot, which is d by dt of r dot, which is minus l as a constant, d by dt of du d theta. And we're going to use chain rule again. Remember, we said u is a function of theta. And so therefore, du d theta is also a function of theta. We could write this as minus L uh, d by d theta of du d theta d theta dt. So d theta dt is theta dot. This is just two derivatives of u with respect to theta. OK. And for theta dot, we're going to write u squared times l. So if we combine all of those things, r double dot is equal to minus l. Um, theta dot is going to be u squared times l. And then we have d2u d theta 2 or 
combining everything, we get minus u squared l squared d2u d theta 2. OK, good. So let's write down what equation 1 was. And let's plug in some of the results that we wanted to use. So finally, returning to equation 1, which was, uh, it was mass times r double dot minus r theta dot squared was equal to minus k over r squared. OK. We now have um, m, r double dot, we just worked out, is minus, uh, I'll write it as l squared u squared d2u d theta 2. And then we have minus r. r we redefined as 1 over u. And then we had theta dot squared. What we're going to do is we're also going to use our expression for theta dot u squared l here. So we would get u squared l for theta dot. And then we have to square it equals minus k. And we have 1 over r squared, but 1 over r is equal to u, so we have u squared k. OK. Um, so there's a negative sign in front of all of our terms. And so we could rewrite this as um, m l squared u squared d2u d theta 2 plus um, m. And then we have u to the fourth divided by u. So I guess we have a u cubed l squared is equal to uh, my plus. So we got rid of all the minus signs. So we get u squared k. OK. The next step is to divide by m u squared l squared. Um, so in the first term, we have exactly m l squared u squared. So after we divide by that, we just are left with d2 u d theta 2. Then we divide by m in the second term, so that cancels the m. We divide by u squared, so we get a u. We divide by l squared, so the l squared's gone. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we divide by u squared, so that's gone. And so we get k over m l squared. Let's just note that. On the right-hand side, we just have a bunch of constants. k is g times the product of masses. m is the mass of our planet. l is the angular momentum divided by mass. OK, so this is the differential equation. Oh. This is the differential equation that we could solve to determine the theta dependence of u. We can solve this differential equation to find the theta dependence of u, and therefore also r, right? If I know the theta dependence of u, then I take the inverse, and I have the theta dependence of r. Um, what I want to show you is that this differential equation is very much like the differential equation of a harmonic oscillator. 
Um, to do that, let's make one more change of variables. So we could write this as d2u d theta 2 is equal to, um, I'm going to do it this way, I'm going to do it as minus, and then it's u minus k over ml squared. So I subtract off the u and then factor out a minus sign. I'm going to define one more, one more change of variables. Define w is equal to u minus k over m l squared. Okay. If we do that, then two derivatives of w with respect to theta is equal to two derivatives of u with respect to theta. And because the k m over, over m l squared is constant, so when we take a theta derivative, that just vanishes. OK, that means we could write this differential equation as d2 w d theta 2 minus, and then u minus k over ml squared was just w. Uh, sorry, so I have to go equals minus w. So I want to compare to the harmonic oscillator, which had an equation of motion that looked like x double dot equals minus k over m times x. It looks very similar. The only difference is that the coefficient in front of our w is say a 1 instead of a k over m. OK. The other difference is that in the harmonic oscillator case, we're taking time derivatives. But um, in the case of our problem of an orbiting planet, we're now taking theta derivatives. Other than that, they're pretty similar mathematically. The solution to the harmonic oscillator is as you know, x is some amplitude cosine of some resonant frequency omega naught times t minus you know a phase factor theta naught where omega naught is equal to root k over m. Okay, but what about our problem? It has the same mathematical form, so the solution should be um, w is equal to some amplitude cosine. And um, what we got in the harmonic oscillator case is first a constant omega naught, which was square root k over m. For our problem, k over m it's just 1, so we get the square root of 1, which is just 1. So we get 1 times our, whatever the variable we're taking derivatives with respect to. In the harmonic oscillator case, it was time. In our case, it's theta. And then we subtract off a possible phase shift. OK, so the constants. The constants a and theta naught are integration constants. So the constants a and theta naught are integration constants. OK, now let's, let's unravel all of this stuff. Um, we've got this variable w. Let's 
let's rewrite it in terms of u. So u is going to be w plus k over ml squared. Okay, so u, which was 1 over r, is going to be w plus k over ml squared. But we now have a solution for w, so that's k m l squared and then plus w is a cos theta minus theta naught. All right, then we take the inverse of all of this to get r, and it's 1 over k m l squared plus a cos theta minus theta naught. So that's a solution for the theta dependence of the radius of an elliptical orbit. Um, I'd like to get rid of some of the constants in here. In particular, we're going to try to eliminate the theta naught. It's an integration constant, and what we need to do is we need to impose some kind of condition to determine what that integration constant is. So by convention, we usually define the position of closest approach to be theta equals 0. So what does that mean if I was to draw an elliptical orbit and so let's put the sun over here then what we're saying is that this distance of closest approach is r naught and that's the theta equals zero case so we're going to measure theta from the horizontal uh, and that also corresponds to the distance of closest approach of our planet. Okay. Um, so, how do we minimize this calculation that we've done for R? So, to minimize R and therefore determine R naught, we want the denominator to be a maximum. That is, we want to just divide by the biggest possible number to make R small. Um, K and m and l squared and a are all constants. The only thing that varies is the cosine function. So the denominator is a maximum when cosine is a maximum, and cosine can't be any bigger than 1. So we, sorry, we set theta equal to 0 because that's what we're going to choose the angle to be for the closest approach condition and we want therefore cos of minus theta naught to be equal to 1. Well when's cosine equal to 1? Cosine of 0 is equal to 1. So theta 0 is equal to 0 satisfies Uh, cos minus theta 0 equal to 1. All right, so that means, therefore, what we're left with is r is equal to 1 over k m l squared plus a cos theta after determining that theta naught is equal to zero, or often this is rewritten as let's multiply top and bottom by k over ml squared. 
then we could write it in this form. We get, oh, sorry, no, I, that's not right. I want to multiply top and bottom by ml squared over k. L squared over K and then we get a M L squared over K cos theta all right good so what I want to do is I want to show that this expression looks like the expression of ellipse and you can probably already see it. Um, I found that the software that I'm using starts to get, doesn't respond well when there's lots of notes. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to continue on a new sheet and let's see if that's going to help. So I want to compare what we just calculated and so I'll rewrite it compare r is equal to ml squared over k divided by 1 plus a m l squared over k cos theta to our ellipse equation which was r is equal to alpha 1 plus epsilon cos theta Okay, um, well, as long as we identify alpha as ml squared over k and epsilon, the eccentricity, as a ml squared over k, then mathematically these two expressions are equivalent. We can see that uh, planets are subject or planets that are subject to a gravitational force minus g m m over r squared r hat follow elliptical orbits with alpha is m l squared over k and epsilon is equal to a m l squared over k. And so let's just remind ourselves that l is the angular momentum per unit mass which is also r squared theta dot and k was the gravitational constant times the product of the sun's mass and the sun's mass. Okay, last time we calculated this alpha, which was the lattice rectum of the orbit, um, we found alpha was a one minus epsilon squared. And so let me just remind you in the picture what that corresponded to. That corresponded to theta equals zero. So it's the vertical distance from the focus to the boundary of the ellipse. Um, so what we could do is if we have an expression for alpha, ml squared over k, and we have an expression for epsilon, a ml squared over k, we could solve for the semi-major axis of the ellipse. Therefore, A is alpha divided by 1 minus epsilon squared is equal to for our orbiting planet ML squared over K divided by 1 minus A ML squared over K. Then we have to square it. And so this is 
the semi major axis of our orbit. Okay, and how was the semi major axis defined? Put a vertical line through the midpoint of your ellipse, and the distance to the farthest edge is the semi major axis. Okay, so that's Kepler's uh, law of ellipses, the first law. Uh, what I want to see if we could end with is also a calculation of the third law. And if we can do that, then we will have done all three of Kepler's laws. So Kepler's third law, which was t squared is proportional to a cubed. Um, so it'll turn out that actually this one is not so difficult to do because we can use a lot of the work that we've already done in calculating the first law and the second law. In fact, the second law is our starting point. So from the second law, we know that a dot is equal to angular momentum divided by 2m. OK, which is also this angular momentum per unit mass divided by 2. Now obviously a dot is just dA dt. So if we integrate with respect to time over a period, so let's integrate a dot over one full period. Okay, so we get the integral of a dot dt is equal to the integral of dA dt dt, which is just a. Um, now, if we do this over one full period, then our planet has completed one orbit, and this area is the area swept out by the radius vector. And so if we do a full orbit, the radius vector sweeps out the entire area of the ellipse. And so this is the area of our ellipse. Now, the area of an ellipse is equal to pi a times b, where b is the semi-minor axis. And so we'll, we'll try to figure out if we can f determine an expression for b in just a second. Now what's kind of neat here is that a dot is a constant. I mean, in fact, that is Kepler's second law. And so if that's a constant, I can pull that outside the integral. And so then we get a dot, the integral of dt from 0 to t is equal to the area of our ellipse. Um, OK. This is just the period t. We wrote down above that a dot is l over 2. And so if we combine everything, what we get is that l over 2 times t is equal to pi AB, or the period is equal to 2 pi AB over L. OK. So B is the semi-minor axis of the ellipse. So let's see if we can determine an expression for b. We'll draw a picture first. 
So here's an ellipse, that one's not bad. And here's our two foci. Let's say this is f prime and this is f. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this with a horizontal line, divide it in half. And this distance from the center to the closest point, the nearest point, is the semi-minor axis B. Okay, um, and then we know that from F prime to a point on the boundary is R prime, and from F to a point on the boundary is R. The other thing we know is the eccentricity of the ellipse determines the distance of the two focus points from the center. So we require also for ellipse that at any point on the boundary R prime, R prime plus R is equal to 2A, where A is the semi-major axis. Now in our particular case here, from the symmetry you can probably see that it must be the case that R and R prime are equal. So by symmetry, in our current case, we have r prime is equal to r. So in other words, 2 times r is equal to 2 times a, or r is equal to a. So now what we have is a right angle triangle that we can analyze. And so I'll draw it in green. And if I redraw that over here, what our right angle triangle is, is a hypotenuse of length a we just determined and this side is epsilon times a and this side is b and so by the Pythagoras theorem b squared must be equal to uh, a squared minus epsilon a squared which is a squared 1 minus epsilon squared, or b is equal to a square root 1 minus epsilon squared. All right, so there's an expression for b, and what we're going to do is we're just going to insert it into our expression for the period. So the period, if we just rewrite it, um, Let's see, what was it? 2 pi a times b. 2 pi a times b divided by l. Okay, so now we have 2 pi a times b. So we're going to get an a squared, square root 1 minus epsilon squared, divided by l. Or, if we square everything, t squared is 4 pi squared a to the fourth 1 minus epsilon squared over l squared but recall that um, alpha the lattice rectum was a 1 minus epsilon squared and so that means what we have here, a to the fourth, 1 minus epsilon squared, could be rewritten as, could be rewritten as a cubed times alpha. OK, so what do we have then? We have t squared is equal to 4 pi squared 
and then I'm going to write alpha divided by L squared and A cubed. And so you can already see now the emergence of Kepler's third law where T squared is proportional to A cubed. And so this is our third law. Um, just to finish this off, we calculated already some results for elliptical orbits. So for elliptical orbits, we found that alpha was equal to m l squared over k. And so that means we have t squared is equal to 4 pi squared over L squared. Alpha is M L squared over K. That's nice because the L squareds are going to cancel. Uh, K was equal to G and a product of masses. And then we have A cubed. And so our final result then is t squared is equal to 4 pi squared g over m a cubed. So we've done actually a little bit better than just calculating or proving Kepler's third law that t squared is proportional to a cubed. We in fact also found the constant of proportionality. And let's just remind ourselves that m, big M, is the mass that the object is orbiting. So if we're talking about planets in our solar system, then M is the mass of the sun. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping that this time I've recorded some audio and we'll, we'll try this again. Okay, bye-bye.